from the beginning of life on Earth, countless echoes have been left behind, telling hints of what was once living on the very ground we walk on. Each year, we uncover more of these incredible remains, growing our knowledge in the field of paleontology. And today, we're diving into this year's most notable discoveries from September, as part of a series hosted by Edge Science. Welcome to Paleo Rewind. To start, we have a study that brings all extinct animals into question. Led by scientist Joel Gayford and his team, it examines the size estimates for prehistoric animals, focusing on species that often make headlines. The research doesn't uncover any new fossils, but instead revisits past claims. Key subjects include Dunkleosteus, a large armored fish, Helicoprion, a shark with some seriously freaky teeth, Megalodon, which needs no introduction, and Parasitus, a giant whale-like animal named in 2023 as the largest animal to ever exist. Gavard is a shark researcher, hence the focus on aquatic life. The concepts still apply to dinosaurs and other extinct animals though. The focus is proxies, which are the closest relatives of poorly preserved species. For example, Megalodon was initially classified in the same genus as the great white shark. With only its teeth available, its body shape, color, and biology was assumed to just be as though it were a great white on steroids. However, after discovering more of Megalodon's remains, including even parts of its spine and skin, it was revealed that Megalodon was longer and more slender than previously thought, blowing previous assumptions out of the water. Next is the massive length change Dunkleosteus went through in 2023 revising estimates from the size of a small bus to less than half that size, with a new maximum length of around 4 meters, or 13 feet. This was also due to a change in the proxies used to determine the length of the animal, going from using sharks as a reference to more similar kinds of fish, called arthrodires. In the case of Parasitus, though, the issue wasn't as much with proxies, but rather with just making the animal seem so freaking chunky in its initial description, that it would have been physically impossible to achieve its supposed record-breaking size no matter what proxy was used. The debate here was with mass rather than length, changing our estimates of Parasitus from a whopping 340 tons to at or around 100. Helicoprene was the odd one out, since there's nothing alive today that has their freakishly awesome tooth whirls. Nobody even knew what it was used for or even where it was on the animal's head when it was first discovered. We have a slightly better idea now, but that still doesn't help with determining size, resulting in studies, estimates, and art of Helicoprion putting that tooth whirl all over the place. The study goes on to highlight limitations in estimating prehistoric animal sizes, particularly the accuracy of various mathematical models, and the selection of proxies. Using the wrong animal as reference can lead to wildly inaccurate size estimates, which can take decades to correct. It's crucial that scientists choose proxies that are closely related to the specimen being studied. There's also the element of age. Some bones labeled as young adults might in fact be closer to being older individuals, based on how their bones don't fuse until they reach extremely old ages, if at all. Pliosaurs, for example, are known for having bones that hardly fuse, even as adults. However, it's this last point that brings us into question. Yep. You, watching this video, are a part of this study, because a huge influence on paleontology studies and outreach is public perception. One of the things that makes prehistoric animals so popular is their size, and the bigger they are, or how big scientists say they are, rather, largely affects news coverage, publishing opportunities, social perception, and even funding. A lack of sufficient evidence leaves estimates up to the imagination of researchers and public press, allowing the presentation of new specimens as the largest, the heaviest, or other similar adjectives. We have to be more self-aware of how we view paleontology. Remember, these are animals, not dragons, not characters, and certainly not celebrities. So as we move forward with new research, we can be more informed, honest, and self-aware, both with what we do know, but also with what we don't. Our next study is all about dinosaur parenthood, specifically in Lufangosaurus, a plant-eating dino that looked a bit like a sauropod standing on two feet. It's classified as a massospondylid, 
which are a family of dinosaurs that are thought to have given rise to some of the long-necked sauropods like Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus. Lufangosaurus was one of the largest massospondylids, and we have a lot of fossils from it, including those of babies. In a study by Robert Rice and his colleagues, they analyzed those itty bitty bones to determine whether or not Lufangosaurus and other dinosaurs like it were precocial or artricial. Precocial means an animal can move around after hatching, while altricial means an animal can't move around or gather food for itself. The study uses pigeons and chickens as reference. Pigeon hatchlings are incredibly artricial, and they're entirely dependent on their parents, usually the mom, for food and survival for the first bit of their life. Chicken chicks, on the other hand, are precocial, as seen with these cute little guys being able to walk around all on their own. This study is really important, because we almost never get fossilized remains of dinosaur hatchlings, for obvious reasons. They're tiny, brittle, and probably won't stay intact for years and years and years. So when Lufangosaurus hatchlings were found, paleontologists went wild. They looked at how much weight their leg bones could hold up, along with the rate and degree of bone development. Based on this, we now know that Lufangosaurus hatchlings, and likely the hatchlings of other massospondylids, physically couldn't hold themselves up for long periods of time. So now we can feel pretty safe claiming that their parents stayed with, cared for, and even fed their babies for a definitive period of time, which creates some pretty wholesome imagery. We're taking to the skies with this next one, with an analysis of pterosaur wing mechanics in Asdarkids. Asdarkids were a family of flying reptiles that gained popularity through the discovery of Quetzalcoatlus, which currently holds the record for the largest wingspan of any animal ever. This new study takes a look at two recently uncovered Asdarkid specimens, Rambergania, which has a 10 meter or 32 foot wingspan, and Inabtanen, which has a 5 meter or 16 foot wingspan. Both of these are found in the West Asian country of Jordan. Despite being small in terms of its dark kids, Inabtanen is still larger than the largest flying bird alive today, the wandering albatross. This study by Kirsten Rosenbach and her colleagues takes a look at just how these giant flyers got around in the air. Most modern birds typically use one of two flight methods, flapping or soaring. Flapping means the birds use, well, flapping to power their flight. This is what most small birds use. Soaring birds rely less on flapping and more on air currents to keep themselves up in the air. This is what most large birds, like vultures and seabirds, use to save on energy. Bird bones are specifically formed in a way that tells us which one they use. The wing bones of flapping birds contain networks of struts to support the cortical bone which is the harder and more compact part of a bone. With soaring birds, they have spiraling ridges in the center of their wing bones. With the new pterosaur material of Arambergania and Anabtanen, their wing bones were so well preserved that we can see these different formations in them. With Arambergania, scientists found thin ridges in the center of their bones that looked incredibly similar to the ones found in vultures, which would have helped with the wind resistance that comes with gliding. An antennae, on the other hand, had a bunch of hollow yet thick struts, which would have helped with bending, just like a flapping bird. There's a lot we can learn from an animal's lifestyle just from small elements of their bones, and this study proves that. Hopefully, we can use similar methods for other pterosaurs in the future. Now we get into a really fun topic, titanosaurs. These are among not only the largest sauropods, but the largest land animals to walk the earth. Luciano Vidal and his team studied specifically the tails of these awesome and gigantic dinosaurs in order to determine what their uses were and other elements of their mechanics. When it comes to sauropods, it's usually the long-tailed ones like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus that get the most attention on what their tails were used for. Titanosaurs had much smaller tails compared to their body size, so it's thought they were only used for balance and nothing more. Now though, it seems this is far from the truth. Scientists use connection points and digital imagery to pinpoint the neutral pose of titanosaur tails, which is basically how the tails will be positioned comfortably and for most of the animal's lifetime. They also looked at what movements the titanosaur tails would have been most likely been engaging in. They got some varying results, but we know that most, if not all titanosaurs, held their tails in an S-curve of some sort. Aruda Titan, a 15 meter or 50 foot long titanosaur, was found to have had a tail that curved downward quite a bit, 
maybe even to the extreme of touching the ground in some instances. Same with the even bigger Adamantisaurus, which sits at 18 meters or 59 feet long. Based on previous studies on top of this, it seems the larger Titanosaurus had tails more likely to bend downward. Smaller ones, like the 12 meter or 40 foot long Baru Titan, seem to have more horizontal tails. Downward pointing tails for large titanosaurs would have had more uses besides just balance while walking. Tail marks found with sauropod footprints prove this, and make a strong case for the tail being used as a fifth limb of sorts. Everything from digging holes for nests, tripod-esque sumo neck battles, and of course for giving any potential predators a good old wallop. While a short tail may not seem like a good weapon, that's still a comparatively massive tube of muscle that can do some serious damage. This study really makes the case that titanosaur tails were multifunctional and did not mess around. And as if behemoths the size of houses aren't cool enough, our next topic is all about tyrannosaurs. A new species was announced from the Cerro del Pueblo formation in Mexico. It was named Labocania aguilonae. The species name honors Martha C. Aguilon, who discovered the fossils. Back when Earth's continents were all jumbled up compared to today, a giant strip of sea split North America into two sides, Laramidia in the west and Appalachia in the east. Originally, it was thought that Tyrannosaurs only existed in certain sections of these continents with relatively low diversity. However, we now know from numerous fossils that there were Tyrannosaurs everywhere, both in Laramidia and Appalachia, in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Labacania was on the smaller and skinnier end of the Tyrannosaurus spectrum, measuring in at 6.3 meters or 21 feet long and 2 tons, give or take. It's often compared to Bistayuversor, Teratophonius, and Dynamoterror in stature, all of which are medium-sized Tyrannosaurs. This might be a surprise since when most people think of the name Tyrannosaur, their first image is of the family's namesake, Tyrannosaurus rex. But not all of them needed to be so massive. In Labacania's case, it lived in an area that, as far as we know, had prey items that it could handle at its size. Small ankylosaurs, ceratopsians, hydrosaurs, pterosaurs, and even dromaeosaurs made up its ecology. Another awesome part of this discovery is that VFX artist Manuel Barrano collaborated with 3D paleo artist Raul Ramos to create this awesome animation in celebration of the new species. Both of these guys are masters of their craft, especially when it comes to dinosaurs. On the topic of animation, September was actually a pretty big month in terms of prehistoric inspired media. Let's take a look at some. First up is a stunning 2D animated short made by paleo artist Mario Lanzis, titled Antediluvian. This is a passion project that he had been working on for nearly two years. Most of his other works are non-moving illustrations, but after this, I really hope he continues in the craft of animation. The short is largely inspired by the earliest days of paleontology, and now humanity began to change the way they saw the world forever. A homage to the pioneers who were considered outcasts at the time, and the artists who for the first time imagined an entirely different past of our planet. Many early paleo artworks are directly referenced here as well, along with an idea by William Buckland, a paleontologist in the 1800s who thought prehistoric creatures were once punished by God in a series of catastrophes, and the animation does not shy away from showing the implications of this idea. In fact, the word antediluvian is used to refer to the time before the biblical flood. Still keeping with the theme of concepts beyond our comprehension, we have a short film by David Armsby, aka Dead Sound, as the last episode of his Soria series. Titled Rise of the Decade, it focuses on the dark and magical side of Soria, a world where dinosaurs and their humanoid counterparts rule the earth. This episode follows the captain of the Blue Song Empire and his troops as they're ambushed by a mysterious and feral pack of witches and cultists known as the Fell. I won't spoil it, so check out the Dead Sound YouTube channel to see the full thing. He also announced the continuation of his Dinosauria series with a short snippet of what looks to be a Megalosaurus and their kids, so be on the lookout for that. On the more happy-go-lucky and family-friendly side of things, we also got some news regarding Talon, an animated show in production by Lunar Dragon Entertainment. Its logline is basically if Avatar The Last Airbender and The Land Before Time got put in a blender, 
which is one heck of a smoothie. We got some info on a teaser release date, which is now already out for you to watch, along with confirmation that the storyboards for the pilot episode are finished. We also found out that the pilot's release date is looking to be sometime early next year. Check out the Lunar Dragon Entertainment channel to support this awesome indie project. September was a wild month for paleontology, both for discoveries and art. Be sure to take a look at Henry the Paleo Guy's channel for the Paleo Rewind on the previous month of August, and check out October's video on the Omega Pictures channel, releasing tomorrow. Thank y'all so much for watching, love y'all, and as always, keep your pencils sharp.